Now we shall continue with our accomplished and many times decorated speaker, Leonard Apeltzen, as he will tell us about the wacky Wittgenstein family. <clears throat> Friends, this is Ludwig Wittgenstein, arguably the most influential philosopher of the 20th century. Woo! Uh, one day, uh, Ludwig asks a student, have you had any tragedies in your life? And the students are like, what do you mean by tragedies? To which Ludwig responds, well, I don't mean the death of your grandmother at the age of 85. I mean suicides, madness, quarrels. Uh, now, Ludwig was obviously talking about his own family, the Wittgensteins, uh, eight wealthy Viennese siblings who were all incredibly brilliant and incredibly troubled. Many were doomed to an early grave. <laughs> Uh, the, the patriarch of the family was Karl Wittgenstein. When Karl was 17, he runs away from Austria after faking his own death, winds up on the streets of Manhattan where he survives by playing violin. 30 years later, he is one of the richest men in Vienna. He built this huge business empire through business know-how, moxie, and by taking a lot of really stupid risks that all paid off. Uh, during those years, he married Leopoldine, a wealthy heiress with a nervous, anxious temperament. The day of their wedding, Carl is pissed at the carriage driver for driving too slowly, so he punches through the carriage window, sending glass and blood flying everywhere. Not off to a great start. Uh, uh, Carl and Leopoldine have eight children. Their names are Gretel, Helen, Paul, Rudolf, Hermann, Hans, Kurt, and Ludwig. Uh, the children grew up in this opulent palace in Vienna that was visited by some of the most creative minds in that city during that era. Brahms would come by to play piano. Gustav Klimt would stop on by to play into portraits. Here is Klimt's portrait of Gretel uh, Wittgenstein, which she hated. Fun fact, Gretel's husband shot himself after being declared clinically insane. Uh, the Wittgensteins were not a happy family. Uh, the father was uh, brutal and emotionally abusive. The mother was cold and emotionally distant. She only paid attention to the children when they played good music, so most of the children learned how to play very good music early on. Uh, the most brilliant musician in the family was Hans. He was a musical and mathematical savant. Before the age of 10, he could play three different instruments while multiplying astronomically large numbers in his head. Uh, some of the greatest uh, composers in the city all agreed that Hans was a musical genius, and everyone agreed that Hans was mentally not all there. You know what his first spoken word was? It wasn't mama, it was Oedipus. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, so when he was a kid and he would hear music that was off tune, he would throw himself to the floor and scream, wrong, wrong, like actual quote. Uh, by the time he reached his teens, his musical compositions became so dark and morbid that Carl forbid Hans to play his music in the house. Uh, only, like, for real, yeah. Uh, so Hans was by far not the only musical talent in the family. There was Paul, the pianist. He was a piano prodigy, really good at the piano, but very high strung. One time, Paul is practicing his piano, where, and his young brother Ludwig is sitting in the next room, just sitting there and breathing. All of a sudden, Paul starts screaming through the walls, I cannot play when you are in the house, as I feel your skepticism seeping towards me from under the door. Uh, Poor Ludwig, uh, he was the youngest Wittgenstein and he was the only one that couldn't play a musical instrument, so he was considered the dumbass of the family, which his parents would tell him that to his face, you dumbass. Uh, it's not surprising that Ludwig had his first suicidal thought by age 10. Uh, the Wittgensteins were no strangers to dark thoughts. By 1902, uh, Hans, the savant, has run off to South America to get away from his father, and at one point he steps on a boat somewhere in the Americas and is never seen again. Uh, <laughs> most people believe, it's not funny, because uh, <laughs> most people believe that he purposefully jumps 
into the water. Two years later, 1904, uh, Rudolf Wittgenstein, 22 years old, old, walks into a bar, tells the piano man to play a melancholy tune about unrequited love, orders a glass of milk, puts potassium cyanide into the milk, drinks it down, and dies in horrible agony on the spot. Uh, after the funerals, Car Carl forbids uh, uh, his family to mention uh, Rudolf or Hans ever again. Around this time, young Ludwig goes off to uh, study with uh, this man, Bernard Russell, a really great philosopher and mathematician. Russell writes in his letters that uh, Ludwig is an absolute genius, but he's seriously concerned for the young man's mental well-being. Uh, Ludwig has uh, this tendency to burst into Russell's bedroom at 1 a.m. and rant on about logic and philosophy. At one point, Ludwig has a complete breakdown, tells Russell that he's dropping out of college to move to the far dark north, and Russell records this conversation thusly. I said it would be dark, and he said he hated daylight. I said it would be lonely, and he said he prostituted his mind talking to intelligent people. I said he was mad, and he said, God, preserve me from sanity. God certainly will. Uh, 1913, uh, the, Carl the Patriarch dies. The family gathers in Vienna to mourn and receive their share of his vast, vast fortune. The family reunion is short-lived. One year later, the Archduke Ferdinand is assassinated. And the remaining three Wittgenstein brothers, Paul, Kurt, and Ludwig, head off to war. August 1914. Second week of the war, Paul the pianist is on the Eastern Front when he's struck by a bullet. He comes out of a painful delirium 24 hours later and he's on a Russian prison train heading towards Siberia. His right arm has been ripped off at the elbow. When Paul arrives at the prison camp, he finds a wooden crate and a piece of charcoal and draws piano keys on the crate. And he begins to bang away at the crate with his left hand over and over and over again. Guards and fellow prisoners stay out of his way. They are pretty sure he has gone mad. Uh, meanwhile, Jan Ludwig was quite excited about the prospect of war, writing, perhaps the nearness of death will bring me the light of life. He got a medical deferment because of ill health, and he's like, no, nine, fuck that, I'm gonna go and fight. He purposefully volunteers to take on some of the most dangerous assignments imaginable. He gets multiple medals, including one for, quote, lack of fear in battle, and it is surrounded by all this horror and exploding shit else that he has this great realization. The world is composed of facts, not things. But the meaning of the world resides beyond the edge of the world. That meaning cannot be captured through facts and logic alone. Amongst the blood-filled, rat-filled trenches, he begins to scribble down his philosophical ideas into a manuscript. That manuscript is on him when he's taken prisoner on the Italian front. And then there's the fate of poor Kurt the musician with a quote, sunny disposition. <laughs> a month before the armistice, Kurt is leading a group of men into battle when they start deserting in mass. And he's firing his officer's gun in the air, screaming, fight you cowards, turn around and fight. But it is too late, the men have mutinied, they have abandoned him, he's in his trench all alone. And so he put his pistol to his head and pulled the trigger. Soon the war was over. Paul returns crippled from the war. He sits down one-armed at the piano and begins ba to bang away with his left hand over and over again, hours at a time, up to seven hours in a sitting until he gets good enough to do this. Paul went on to spend most of his share of the fortune uh, paying some of the greatest composers of the era to uh, come up with uh, piano compositions that could only be played with his left hand, that only Paul could play. He toured, uh, he actually forbid other musicians. He had copyright on the shit, so no other musician was allowed to play his music. And he got to tour all of the US and Americas. He became known as the greatest one-handed pianist of all time. Uh, meantime, Ludwig also comes back from the war with his great philosophical masterpiece, the Tractatus Logical Philosophicus, which he publishes in 1901. Yeah, no, remain silent. 
Yeah, you guys get it. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> philosophy joke, ask me later. Uh, <laughs> um, so at the, according to this manuscript, there are some philosophical, uh, the great philosophical truths cannot be grasped through philosophical logical language, and therefore all of philosophy is bullshit and doesn't matter. Uh, Wittgenstein proved this philosophically, and he uh, considers all of philosophy to be solved because none of it matters. At this point, he solved all philosophy. He has nothing else left to live for. So uh, he heads out into the beautiful Austrian Alps, and amongst the beauty and the grandeur, he intends to end his own life. But the last minute, he changes his mind. No, there has been too much death. It's time to rebuild and live on. Uh, Wittgenstein, Louis Ludwig, goes on to give away his share of the family fortune. He bums around Europe for about a decade, eventually settling in Cambridge, where he produces some seminal works on the philosophy of language and cognition, none of which would be published in his lifetime. Uh, the surviving Wittgenstein siblings did not get along. Uh, Ludwig told Paul that his one-armed piano playing was shit, and Paul told Ludwig that his philosophy was nonsensical gobbledygook. The siblings uh, squabbled. They stopped speaking to each other. At the start of World War II, they're scattered across all of Europe. The Nazis seize most of their fortune. Their palace in Vienna is bombed by Allied bombers, and eventually the Wittgensteins vanish. Uh, the family disappears, and now that all that is left is some brilliant philosophy, some scraps of beautiful music, and a legacy of tragedy and wasted potential. Why? What does it all mean? According to Ludwig's philosophy, there are some meanings that cannot be logically grasped and should not be spoken about. When asked to lecture on such things, Ludwig would get at the podium and read German poetry instead. And so, I am a string stretched across deep, surging resonance. Things are violin bodies full of murmuring darkness where women's weeping dreams with a rancor of whole generations stirs in its sleep.